Hello all, it's me, Superdude, and I'm wondering how many people here play games that are about work. Most games aren't. We usually are killing demons, or doing skate tricks, or jumping and maybe even running a little bit if you feel so bold. But there are some games that are trying to represent work. You know, the thing you do for money and therefore to continue living. Isn't this an inherently odd thing? You go to work, you clock in, you do your thing for eight hours, and then some people come home and do more labor virtually. I do not like my work enough to continue doing it after hours, and yet, here I am power washing to pass the time with my buds. You ever stop to think about why that is? How is it that games take a concept which is considered unenjoyable, work, and turns it into something enjoyable? Maybe that's the wrong phrasing. You see, for me, work is an office. You go in, you sit at your desk, you plug away at your tasks, and eventually, clock out. You may never see what you've created in full, or the finished product, or the people whose lives are touched by the thing you've made. Video games don't tend to represent office spaces in a positive light very often for the reasons I just described. It's boring and doesn't really show you the fruits of your labor. Instead, video games tend to represent physical labor or blue-collar work. Games like Farming Simulator, Power Wash Simulator, the various truck simulators, Goat Simulator, these tasks each represent work where the output is obvious. I created crops. I cleaned this van. I moved its equipment across three states and successfully parked the trailer when I got there. I goat. I made this. I did this. This fact, combined with the stronger reward structure than, you know, life, means job games are giving you something inherently different than real life work. You go to work because you need money. It doesn't matter if you like your work or not. But games need to be enjoyable. Or do they? No, stop, different video idea, wait your turn. So perhaps the better question is, how do games go about representing work in a way that's fun, but also still feels like you're doing the job? One of the major ways that games as a whole grabs your attention and enjoyment is with numbers go up designs, where the gains are reinvested into the process to get bigger and bigger gains as you play. There are games that entirely surround this process called incremental or idle games, which are the purest expression of this. There's no game here, not really, it's just numbers getting bigger, and reinvesting that number to make number get bigger faster. On a psychological level, we like this. Doesn't matter how bare the gameplay is, this works on humans. One of the earliest examples of this type of game was Cow Clicker, which is making fun of you for doing w what you're doing here. There is no game, there isn't even really a mechanic, it's just a loop of numbers, and that is what makes idle games interesting to talk about. It laid bare a fundamental truth about humans and what games could do to you, even whilst doing nothing to hide how dumb it is, and it's making fun of you in the process. None of that matters. Our brains like it, so we do it. Plenty of games use the number go up design because, as I said, barring everything else, it works, and it's a rather easy path to take if you're trying to represent a job. Power wash as you reinvest your money in washer supplies that do the work more efficiently, faster. In Truck Simulator, you drive a rental until you can afford a truck of your own, which then lets you make more money, which then allows you to buy more garages, hire other employees, buy more rigs, and all that money is continuously reinvested in the process. Stardew Valley is the same as well. Get paid? Turn it into seeds. Continue that growth. Work games love to take a hold of this design and run with it, and it leads to some very chill experiences. You relax, let the game crunch higher and higher values as you get more and more efficient and making money, and your brain softly vibrates as the fundamental enjoyment of numbers go up as achieved. I'm gonna call these business empire games, where you start small and eventually build a massive empire fake money with which to do with what you will. Buy the funny golden tower. Build a massive automation process to make the further money gains even easier. Chase some random personal goal that you set for yourself since money is no object anymore. Lobby the government to lower your taxes, hoarding the wealth for the end times, and contributing nothing to society. Most job games go this route because it's simple and it works. But another thing these games have in common, save Stardew Valley, these games have very sparse narrative. Don't want characters or story getting in the way of my truckin' vibe, so best to go without it. But there are a few games that I've played that do attempt to tell a story whilst representing a workplace, and I'd like to talk to y'all about those games how their stories and their game design intersect with workplace representation, and what kind of work they are championing in doing so. Minor spoilers for the following game, be ready for me to talk about the early hours of these, as well as their design in almost its totality. I hope by the end of this I'll have convinced you to give each of these games a try, but if you're already convinced, please go try them out before looking further. Perhaps you can glean something I don't. With that out of the way, let's get going. The first game I want to talk about is the oldest on this list, and a weird one. 
Papers, Please is a puzzle simulation game, according to Wikipedia, developed by Lucas Pope in 2013. Lucas's development company, 3909, has produced two games in its lifetime, though he's made a couple more independently, with the other being Return of the Obra Dinn, which won multiple awards for having really inventive design and just being playing good the year it released. Both of these games are amazing, and you're missing out if you don't give them a looky. Papers, Please centers the patriarch of a family as his name was pulled in the job lottery, and he is assigned to work at the border checkpoint in the country of Artstotska, a stand-in for Soviet nation. Your job is simple. Check people's documents, and let them into the country if their papers are valid. Deny them otherwise. But tensions are high between you and your neighboring countries, and the politics of the region cause your job to change on nearly a daily basis. The next day, no people allowed in from Republia. The day after, Republicans are allowed when they're searched. Art Stutzkins need their ID to enter, work permits and notices of stay need to be cross-checked against each other, and the passport. Is that actually a city within the region of Oberstan? Does their weight and height match their ID? Is the seal of approval faked? All things you must check to ensure their documentation is on the straight and narrow, and if you miss even a single thing, that's a citation. You're paid based on the amount of people you let through, but three strikes and they start docking your pay, so you must be quick but correct to bring home the biggest bank. Now that you've secured your cheddar, what is there to spend money on? Food. Heating your house. Upgrades for your checkpoint! Open the stamp with the tab button instead of having to click on it, saving seconds out of your day. Ooh, Ten bucks for such a time saver. Living in a communist nation, or at least an American's idea of one, there's not much to spend money on outside of your work and survival. You may be tempted to call this a numbers go up game because you can reinvest your money into the process to make it faster, but trust me, it's not an exponential growth. Probably not linear either. This saves seconds out of your day to the point that by the time you have literally all upgrades, you may be able to do two extra people per day? If your day doesn't end prematurely, that is. This is the gameplay loop of Papers, Please, but what about its story? As I said, you deny people if there's a fault in their documentation, but things are never so simple as that. There's a war on, and a lot of these people are attempting to escape devastation. Some may plead for you to let them through, others may berate you for denying them, and that's just the background noise of the normal folks. There are specific situations the game will throw at you that are asking you to compromise your job for your morals. Stop this human trafficker from coming through, even though his documentation is correct. Don't let Georgie or his abysmally forged document through, even though he's the kindest bloke you ever did see. Don't let this woman through on her faulty documentation, except you know her husband, who has been trying to help her across the border since you've met them, and now that the moment's arrived, her passport has expired. Are you going to turn her away from that? Force these two apart again? And these are the appeals to morality the game has. There are other methods it employs against you. Detain people, even for petty crimes, simply because one of the security officials gets extra money for detainments, and he promises you'll get a cut if you cooperate in the process. Or the EZIC, which I won't speak any further on than that. This is what Papers, Please is actually about. It is testing your ability to stand against corruption. When given a position of power, what causes you to buckle? Is it an emotional appeal? Is it your friends? Money? Or something bigger than yourself? You're not asked to make any moral judgments as you play. In fact, you're punished for doing so. Just do your job! But you can't help that, can you? You're a thinking, feeling person who is forced to pause when presented with choices. Choices that, by the letter of the job, aren't even a choice. The intersection of Paper Please's story and gameplay are trying to communicate that you are a cog in the machine, but people aren't so neatly shaped. Do you support your friends and damn all else? Do you do your job diligently like a good little communist? Or do you take a stand and attempt to knock the country to its knees, all from your little border tech point? The decision is yours. I've already described the work you're doing in Papers, Please as cog-in-the-machine style work. The system around you is much bigger than yourself, and you are just one tiny piece within it that must operate efficiently in order to keep functional, and more importantly to yourself, keep your family alive and secure. The issue is, that tiny cog is important. It needs to be functional, of the right shape, and constantly performing to specifications. Otherwise, the machine may break down. I won't comment on what that could mean for Papers, Please, but I would like to explore another game where you're a cog of the machine just the same, but whose story explores questions of butting heads of the industry you're a part of much more closely. Hard Space Shipbreaker is a game developed by Blackbird Interactive that released in 2020. Up front, I need you to know that I love this game. I've beaten it three separate times. I actively try to keep up with it to ensure there's no DLC content I've missed, and it's the main reason why this video exists. I just want to talk about Shipbreaker, damn it. 
So know that I am incredibly biased in this game's favor, and I want you to play this. Please give this one a go if any of this seems remotely interesting. With that plea out of the way, what actually is Hard Space Shipbreaker? Hard Space Shipbreaker is described as a action-adventure simulation game by the Google, but between you and me, it's a little bit more accurate to call it a space simulation game. You know, zero-g effects, physical objects simulating movements in a zero-g space, all of that. Very much like the Outer Wilds once you get off the planets. You are a fresh employee of Lynx. Exceptionally fresh, in fact. Your acceptance contract is one of the first things you deal with as you start the game. Lynx sends you through a questionnaire that you should really read for yourself, select some light customization, and then you're officially a Lynx employee. First things first, though. They have to make you a spare, which is essentially a clone of yourself with the DNA stored in Link's corporate vaults. One terrible cutscene later, your first official spare is produced and you're given the bill. See, here's the dealio. Making a spare? A few other companies are capable of doing that, and being able to store a highly reproducible copy of your exact DNA structure, that doesn't come cheap. Plus the cost to shoot you in space for all this, your new living arrangements, the equipment, that's all gonna come out to 1.252 billion dollars. Cash or credit? Not being a billionaire yourself, you are now indebted to the company, which charges you interest on your tab as well as the upkeep for your equipment and your bunk. Now swimming in an Olympic pool of your own debt, your boss calls you and tells you it's finally time for shipbreaking. Here's your first ship. Your goal is to completely take it apart and send its components to the right location. Large and reusable ship parts are sent to the processor. Ship systems and furniture to the barge for use everything else to the furnace. And that's it. You move things with your grappling hook and separate larger pieces from the hole using the cutter. You have to worry about your cutter overheating and your grapple is only so strong, so you need to get clever with how you separate the pieces and get them to their correct stations. You have 15 minutes on the clock to get this done, and you need to keep an eye on your vitals as well. Run out of oxygen, you die. Run out of fuel, you'll have to pull yourself around by your grapple, and good luck being even remotely useful at getting yourself where you need to go doing that. You damage your suit too much. If you run low on any of your supplies, you can re-up yourself at the company store. Peeling apart a ship, barging all the random chairs and subsystems inside, then melting down the frame to complete the job and leaving your worksite completely empty is one of the most satisfying experiences I've had in recent years, and is the reason I've beaten this game three times. The story of the game starts out nice enough. You're one of several workers at Morgan Station, and you slowly get to know the other folks over the course of the game through after-work calls and radio chatter. None of these characters are terribly deep, they more serve to give you an idea of a type of person. The hotshot. The older folk who've been at it for years now. The kind guy who's also kind of terrible at his job. And of course, your laid-back foreman. Archetypes for people you've probably worked beside in real life. Eventually, the conflict starts as some of your fellow workers start talking about the conditions of work. The mountain of debt you're saddled with after sign-on, the definitely unsafe working conditions, just because you can be brought back to life doesn't mean that last you didn't die and experience horrible pain while doing so. Once someone starts bringing up workers' rights, the conflict of the game truly begins. And I'm not gonna get further into the plot than that, I promise. The ships start out quaint enough, but as you progress, your workload starts growing, slowly at first, and then at a pace you can't keep up with. New systems are introduced that you need to know how to operate. Pressurized ship cabins that you need to depressurize safely in order to use. Ship reactors that start to melt down when removed from their housing, so you need to have an exit strategy if you're going to... Power supplies with a special shutdown sequence so that you can pull it after. As the ships get bigger, the timer doesn't change, and your quotas never change, meaning it's up to you to either learn the ins and outs of the ship to get more efficient, or cut corners. Sure, you're given a couple of extra tools, and you can upgrade your stuff, but those upgrades can't keep up with the scale of the ship you're faced with. This is what it feels like to play Shipbreaker. It is engaging, it is interesting, and it is an exercise in problem solving on the fly and being given a set of tools and being told to figure it out. This zero-g ship dismantle simulator is super engaging, and the work is fun, but it is also dangerous. If my previous statements haven't made it clear, the people in charge don't value you, and your training is less and less pronounced as your overseers start trimming the fat in the name of profit. During reactor training, you are given unlimited time and resources to perform the checklist in a safe environment. For power supplies, less. By the time you reach radiation filters, there's not even a checklist. The game gets harder, and you're thrust deeper into open space as you're having to navigate without the support you'd like. 
Though the work is deeply engaging, the business seems fit to put you in further and further danger, which is what drives the plot of the game. This is a representation of a different side of being a cog in the machine, the fact that you are tiny compared to the whole, and your suffering is rather meaningless in the face of the company's bottom line. And as some of your peers push for unionization, the company only adds to your suffering and retaliation. The intersection of story and gameplay is interesting to me here, because the work is good. No one in your company hates the work, and the gameplay is meant to reflect that truth in that the work is fun. It is engaging, it's easy to wrap your head around what's required, but a different task entirely to actually pull off. You get the sense that it's hard work, but satisfying to do if you were physically there. But you wouldn't want to be physically there, because the lack of safety regulations would be a nightmare, and that's the opposite end of that coin. Your character, the hotshot, the foreman, their voices either aren't heard, are actively ignored, or punished for speaking out. They love the job, they just want to have a say in the business. They want things to get safer, or have better conditions, and also, and I'm just spitballing here, to not be under the thumb of over a billion dollars in debt. This game is deeply sympathetic to the plight of the blue-collar workers on the lowest rung of an organization, and the concept of unions as a whole. I recommend you give this game a shot yourself for both the really fun time tearing ships apart, and to see how the story unfolds. Setting aside any of your personal baggage about workers' rights or unions, this game is an excellently designed challenge arranged into 15 minute chunks, and each ship brings new wrinkles to the puzzle, even across the same model. I definitely have a soft spot for this one, and I hope you find a place in your heart for Shipbreaker as well. The final game I want to talk about is demonstrably different from the other two mentioned in its workplace fantasy. We've been playing games where you're the little guy in a larger operation, but what about when you're the boss? There are levels to business, and so far we've only talked about the bottom rung. Escaping the cog of the machine structure altogether, we enter small business ownership, where you are in charge. This is the fantasy for a lot of people in America, and plenty of games let you pull this off. The previously mentioned Numbers Go Up style games do this a lot. Moonlighter, a game that I really enjoyed for the time I spent with it, is about a small business owner who moonlights as a dungeon explorer, hence the name, using the materials found in the dungeons as supplies for their shop. It's not too long, and though I wish there was more complexity to the shop, at $15 it's a very good time for its price point, and I recommend it to everybody. But notice how easy this is. This is the part of Moonlighter that's meant to be challenging, this is just a good time. However, trust me, small business ownership is anything but relaxing. With lots of administrative upkeep to do with few employees, if you have any at all, all the greater business tasks fall to you, the business owner, to perform. No human resources, no logistics, no secretary, it's all done on your time. And that is time consuming, and can take away from the thing you actually wanted to do. Coming from two small business owners myself, I can tell you that this would be a lot more stressful than the game represents. There's only one game that I've ever played that truly tried to represent the pressure of small business ownership in this way, and that is Potionomics. Potionomics is the premier release of Voracious Games, and I think this game is fantastic. It sits perfectly between two of my fantasies, being a merchant and being an alchemist. Potions were real, I'd be making videos on how to craft elixirs in a second, believe you me. This game is bright and lively, with wonderful animation that does a good job of evoking who each character is. That's honestly the best word for this game, evocative. It does a lot with a little, and works hard to make each character feel lively, and the setting feel well-realized and fun to be in. You're dropped into this fantastical world, a young woman fresh from alchemy school, ready to make her mark on the world. Problem though, you discover your uncle, who was your inspiration for becoming an alchemist by the way, disappeared, left his shop in complete disarray, and left a mountain of debt which now falls on you to pay off. The shop's condition is so terrible that you can't even start up potion production, and yet you're expected to pay off at least $10,000 in 10 days? Luckily for you, there's a way out. There's an alchemy competition that starts in 10 days that has all of the island's top alchemists competing for glory, and also a cash prize that pretty much exactly matches your payment amount. How convenient! With no other hope of making the money in time, your mission is set. Make the best possible potions for the competition within 10 days, so you can keep your newly minted business afloat for, well, just long enough before the next payment is due. So how does one make potions? Each ingredient has an amount of magic potency, or magamins, specific to each ingredient. There are five varieties of magamin, and different ratios of different types produces different potions. For example, one to one of A and B makes a health potion. 
Higher values beget stronger potions, and the closer you are to the exact ratio you're looking for, the better the price. Potions take time to brew though, so in the meantime you could visit the town and see about procuring some more ingredients. But the surrounding island is dangerous, for normal people at least, so gathering materials requires you to either buy them, finance a trip to scour for the materials in the environment, or hire an adventurer to do that for you. Once you've got your ingredients, you're set- oh crap, the shop is a mess. You should probably hire a guy to fix up the shop and maybe get a renovator to make it look nice. It would pay to have more cauldrons, but, well, I don't have enough money for that. I gotta make some money. Right! The potions! Gotta take those out and get some more brewing. Sell those. Need to procure more ingredients. Is that Adventurer Mac? He needs how much to buy a new stand? It's already late, and I didn't even finish my second batch! God. There are many different types of game layered on top of each other here. The various people you meet can all fall into a friend or romance system, so there are some visual novel elements. But this also feeds back into the money loop, so you're going to want to engage with this at least a little. If you don't want to romance anyone, you don't have to, I promise. The actual selling of your potions is done through a deck builder, so that's kind of cute. But the central thing you're doing, the main thrust of the time, is running around, trying to do everything you can within your delicate time frame to keep your business afloat. Lots of things cost money, money which you can only make through your potions, but everything, everything, costs time. And that's the true resource you're up against. You must make your three potions before the day of the competition, but they must also be strong enough to win against your competitors. How do you know if they are? You don't. So you keep improving. Keep growing your craft, making more and more potions until you've made something as good as you can possibly do. Then you compete. Hopefully that one's good enough. In this way, Potionomics is the most realistic small business simulator I've ever seen because it captures the stress of small management. I will concede that the story's tone doesn't mess with this fact. It's a bubbly time with larger-than-life characters and goof-em-ups aplenty. But the text of the story belies this underlying threat that all small business owners feel starting out. Can I make enough money to pay off the debtors? Or for a real-life example, can I pay rent or cover my taxes? Do I even have enough time to make that money on top of all the other things I need to get done in order to ensure that I can do my job? It's tough going, but once you cross that threshold and make the money you need, there's a wash of relief before you have to pick yourself up and do it again. That seems pretty true to life from my perspective. A little more detail outside of my gameplay versus story framework. The game is a numbers go up game. You will eventually be making lots of money, so this will be a non-issue at some point. Just like we hope it would be in real life, except... no. This game's story does end, and there is an endless mode for those who enjoy doing that sort of thing for funsies. Shipwrecker has one of those too, now I'm thinking about it. And if you are having a hard time, I recommend you keep pushing. It does get easier once you get the ball rolling. All in all, this is a very fun, and at times stressful game about time and resource management, and it exactly plays into my personal fantasies when it comes to what I would like in my life. I would love to be an alchemist. And maybe you would like to as well. Conclusion time, conclusion time! Isn't it weird that we make games about working? Why is that? Probably because it's an interesting challenge, turning a laborious task into an entertaining one. There are a couple of ways that we've achieved this in the past. The first and perhaps most common way is numbers go up, but that doesn't tend to have a lot of story built in. How about our story-based work games? For those, we have Papers, Please and Hard Space Shipbreaker, two games that consider what it's like to be on the lowest rung of the corporate ladder and ask you two different questions. How susceptible are you to corruption, and how do you fight back against your greedy corporate overlords? And Potionomics, taking a step up to small business owner and asking if you have what it takes to keep your business afloat. All games I love, all games you should try for yourself. I am SuperDude, thanks for watching. Hey, hi, hello again. Thank you for watching to the end of the video, which is how you are hearing me right now. I have a bad habit of when I get off of work, uh, playing these sorts of games, or at least the numbers go up style of these games. I think that's a lot, ha a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, you don't have to think too hard about those types of games. So, yeah, I just wanted to talk about it because, you know, weird concept games that represent a menial task. Um, so yeah, I have a Twitch. I have, obviously, this YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to mention other games that you guys like that represent work in different ways, or even in the same ways, uh, because, you know, obviously I've proved I like these, so... So please give me recommendations and recommend them to each other, because that's what this is all about. I am SuperDude. Thank you again for watching.